I just upgraded this new laser from my wood shop. As I go through setting it up and using it to make this cutting board, I'll share with you eight tips from my hard lessons learned that'll save you a ton of time and frustration in setting up a new laser. I'll also share why I needed to upgrade my laser and why I chose this one. And I'll show several examples of what you can do with the laser in the wood shop, including making the template that I used to cut this handle with, the inlay for this maple and cherry, and of course the engraving. Let's dive in. My first lesson learned tip when setting up a new laser is to establish a repeatable 0, zero reference point. Some may suggest that you use this frame button and then watch the laser head move really fast to outline the engraving boundaries and somehow get your workpiece perfectly placed and square out in the middle of this ocean of honeycomb. But that was not working for me. Any software used to lay out the engraving has a zero zero point, and in my opinion, the workpiece placement in the laser bed should be relative to that same zero zero point. The solution I came up with uses a piece of half inch plywood. I drilled the holes for the legs for the laser, and then I cut out this opening for the honeycomb panel to fit. The solution is portable and repeatable, which is important to me since I don't have a dedicated space for my laser. I need to set it up each time I want to use it. Before cutting the plywood, I had determined the exact spacing of the cutout by first running some tests on the laser. To determine the y-axis zero point, I placed the honeycomb tray against the leg, and then I engraved a small square at 50 millimeters. Then measured where its actual location is. And I determined a 2.5 millimeter offset is needed in the plywood, which will put the edge of the honeycomb at exactly zero for the y-axis. I then used the same technique for the x-axis, but because of interference from the legs, I wasn't able to shift it far enough to get the corner of the honeycomb right at zero for the x-axis, so instead I cut this clear piece of acrylic spacer exactly the right width. So now I know this is my zero zero reference point every time I use the laser. Tip number two is to have a plan for the smoke exhaust fume management because you should not be breathing this stuff. With my previous laser, I just opened up the garage doors anytime I used it, and if it was a breezy day and not too cold, it worked fine, but it limited when I could use the laser based on the weather outside. One of the reasons I chose to get this laser is that it comes with a very affordable hood that fits the laser perfectly. I also purchased this air purifier. I chose this one because it's one of the more affordable ones that has a carbon filter to neutralize the chemically dangerous fumes, and it's also rated HEPA compliant, that is it filters 99.7% of the bad stuff. Venting the fumes directly outside would be a better solution, but for my situation it just wasn't practical. Tip number three is to use the light burn software. Some lasers may come with their own software, but most of these diode lasers rely on either using light burn, which costs money, or laser gerbil that's free. And I initially thought, free is better. I started using laser gerbil. It was just a distraction to figure it out, and then only to learn that it was really worth it for me to pay for light burn. Laser gerbil does have some nice features for engraving photographic images. I did this one on my dog using laser gerbil. But for about everything else I'm using the laser for, light burn that's significantly better. And note that I have no affiliation with Lightburn. I'm just sharing my experience that trying to make laser gerbil work for me, it felt like an unnecessary distraction, and I should have just started with Lightburn from the get-go. Tip number four is to practice on the basswood samples that came with the laser before diving into a real project. At least for me, I get frustrated trying to work on a project when I'm still fumbling around and figuring out some new tool, and the laser is not the easiest thing to figure out. And that brings me to my next tip, which is to use the material test matrix feature in Lightburn often. Likely that your laser manufacturer will provide a small list of settings to start with, but it's just a start and likely pretty limited. Feature in Lightburn is really slick. You can create a matrix of settings to run a test to help you dial in the right laser settings for your project. In this case, I'm varying the laser speed and power to test cutting this 2mm basswood and determine that 700 millimeters at 80% power works great. And when you find the right setting, then tip number six is to make use of the library feature in Lightburn to save the settings for future use. Before I discovered this feature, I was writing down settings on post-it notes and it was a disorganized mess. This library feature is a lifesaver. So let's dive into making this cutting board next. 
Note that so far I've gone through six tips that I recommend to do as a way to get familiar with your laser before even starting the first project. And I've got a couple more tips to come in the process of showing how I use the laser for templates, inlays, and engraving on this cutting board project. This laser claims to be able to cut 15 millimeter wood in a single pass, which should work good for making templates. And it's one of the main reasons I'm upgrading to this more powerful laser was that my 5 watt laser just wasn't cutting it. I want to cut templates in this half inch MDF, but I guess MDF is more difficult for a laser to cut than wood because no matter how many passes, I could not get it to cut this MDF. It really just pretty much caught on fire and still didn't cut all the way through. So I'm kind of bummed. Maybe I should have gotten the 40 watt version. My backup option is to cut templates from this 9 millimeter black acrylic. And this laser has no problem cutting this. Although the acrylic is a bit more expensive than the MDF, it does work really good for templates. And there are so many uses for templates in word working, and I'm stoked to be able to cut perfect shapes with the laser. Once I have the template cut on the laser, then I can mark with a pencil the outline on my workpiece. I'm just doing a rough cut on the bandsaw and making sure to keep the cut outside the pencil lines. Then attach the template to my rough cut workpiece using double sided tape. With the use of a flush trim bit on my router table, I'm able to clean up the cut and replicate an exact match of the template onto the workpiece. There's a little bit of practice needed to do this, a little bit of technique required. My advice is to just go slow, short and shallow cutting passes. Here you can see I missed a little piece, but it's no problem. Just go back and clean it up. The result is a really clean cut and a perfect match to the template. Okay, so I might have celebrated with the thumbs up a bit early because I forgot to drill the hole. So I reattach the template and then drill the center hole on the drill press. After a quick sanding, I'm ready to move on to cut the inlay. Moving on to do the inlay of the flower and the engraving. This is the first engraving I've done in a walnut since I got this new laser, so I'm going to use the material test feature in Lightburn to dial in the engraving settings. Looks like 6,000 millimeters per minute and 35% power will work good, and just to double check, I engraved some words to test that setting. It doesn't look so good. See how it's darker on the fringes of the engraving? To fix that, I need to properly set the overscan setting in Lightburn, which is my tip number seven. Those dark edges are caused because the laser has to slow down, stop, turn around and go the other direction and get back up to speed on each pass. By increasing the overscan, it gives the laser a bit of runway to make the direction change at each pass and get back up to full speed before getting back to the engraving boundary. I also believe that I want a bit deeper engraving and I bump up the power to 45% for the next test. And it's still dark along the edges, so I bumped the overscan all the way up to 10%, which seems like a lot to me, but it's what it takes to get good quality with this laser, so it's what I'm going to do. So once I've established good settings for engraving on Walnut, then I use the library feature to save those settings for the future. I've been working on the overall engraving design. To do the inlay of the flower, I need to separate out the drawing. It's currently just a single object. So I use this feature in Lightburn to offset shapes and go one millimeter offset, both inside and outside, and it separates out the overall outline of the flower from the petals. Then I delete the original single object and to get all the pieces back to the original size, then I use the offset shapes feature again to move it back one millimeter. Now I can just pull out all of the petals and put them over here to the side for now. I'm going to cut them out of eighth inch thick maple here in a bit. By the way, this flower is supposed to be a squash blossom as requested by the bride. 
The inlay needs to be about two millimeters deep, which is deeper than a typical engraving. And again, I use the material test feature in Lightburn and determine the inlay settings for Walnut and also save that to my library for future use. Burn only the flower inlay portion of the design, I select the option to cut selected graphics and kick off the laser. The result looks great. It's a nice deep engraving that I can inlay some flower petals. So next is to cut the petals for the flower from some two and a half millimeter maple. But first I need to determine the kerf of this laser, which is tip number eight in setting up a new laser. The width of the laser cut, or its curve, is important to know when doing inlays so that the inner shapes can be cut a little bit larger to account for the curve and make sure they fit tight. I'm setting up a simple test here in Lightburn to cut one baseline circle and then a series of other circles with varying curve offsets. You can see the circle with no curve offset have some space which wouldn't look good on an inlay. By doing some test fits, I determined the kerf is about 0.1 millimeters, and I'll use this setting from now on when doing inlays. So I'm just making some pencil marks on a piece of maple. I just want to make sure I keep the petals right side up when I'm gluing them in later. It looks great, and I'm ready to glue them in. When the glue is dry the next day, I sand it all down flat and ready to do the engraving. So I'm confident that I can get the workpiece set back down in the honeycomb at the exact same spot to do the engraving because I established a repeatable 0, zero reference point that I discussed earlier. This time I select all of the graphics that I want engraved and start the laser. It takes about 45 minutes to engrave all of this, but the wait was worth it. I couldn't be happier with the results. I just do a real light sanding to clean up the burn marks. So just a couple of summary notes. I mentioned earlier that I upgraded because my 5 watt laser wasn't powerful enough to cut templates or inlays. I thought this 22 watt laser would be good enough for MDF templates. However, it won't cut half inch MDF. I am able to still do templates using 9 millimeter black acrylic though. And I'm really happy with the quality of the engraving. Creality did send me this laser, although I have no obligation on what to say, and all of the content in this video is completely my own perspective. I received a lot of offers from different brands of lasers that I turned down, and I chose to go with Creality because they have an affordable complement of accessories, which I did purchase myself. And the laser itself is a pretty good price compared to other similar lasers. And as I'm putting on some mineral oil on the first project with this new laser, I have to say I'm pretty happy with the result. Thanks so much for watching.